The soda machine has a long history in video games. It ranges back to The Secret of Monkey Island from 1990 to Final Fantasy VII Remake from 2020. You might have stumbled upon many soda machines in games without even noticing it. In 2016, Jess Morris had started the so-called Video Game Soda Machine Project, a catalog which contains over 3000 video games with soda machines. The question is, why are there so many soda machines in video games? since they are such a specific object. In his paper, I'd like to buy the world a Nuka-Cola, the purposes of and meanings of video game soda machines, Morissette proposes multiple reasons and effects behind those objects. Of course, a soda machine has great potential for an advertising opportunity for real-world soda brands. Yet such advertising only occurs in only 2% of the catalog video games. Morissette argues that soda machines are a means of grounding the player in the game world, which now contains a greatly familiar element from the real world. As advertising itself has a big role in our everyday life, a soda machine and every other video game may just reinforce and contribute to modern consumerist culture. The idea of embedding soda machines inside video games is a type of product placement. It is not a new term that has emerged recently. It has its roots in all old forms of moving images, and is as old as the cinema itself. Among the first films by Louis Lumiere is Pavis de Notre Dame in 1896, which features a horse cart that bears the name of Vici. French brand of mint sweets. Another film from the same year shows another horse card that features the brand Sunlight Savon, Die Fale du et de Bataillon. Product placement has found its way in all forms of media until today. Movies, TV shows, video clips and video games. Like many other media before it, different companies saw the, at the time, new media of video games as a potential advertising opportunity. Many tactics that are still used today, albeit in different forms sometimes, were originally conceived around this time. In 1978, Adventureland had the first sign of advertising in video games. We see the earliest movie tie-in game in Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1982, which promoted the movie of the same name. The first advert game is Tapper in 1983, which was originally produced to promote beer, before getting popular enough to get an arcade release, which replaced the regular beer with root beer. Many companies also commissioned games to promote their brands. Some of them were completely original games, like Who's What in 1994, to promote 7up. Others were just reskins of already critically acclaimed games. Examples for this would be Pepsi Invader which was a reskin of Space Invaders featuring a Coca-Cola themed tank shooting at the Pepsi logo, as well as Czech's Quest, which was a reskin of Doom meant to promote Czech cereals. It also was the first game to be packaged within a cereal box. Many other games also sold their free spaces to advertisers. For example, the first FIFA game in 1994 featured advertisements for Panasonic, and the Dreamcast classic Crazy Taxi in 1999 had the player drive their passengers to places like Pizza Hut or KFC. Nowadays, it's rather easy to just include promotional material in games by merely patching them for a certain advertisement campaign, so that the free-to-play shooter Fortnite, for example. In a promotional campaign for the movie Avengers Endgame, many of the movie characters' signature items were patched into the game for the players to use. Most advert games nowadays are produced for the mobile market. Examples for this would be the city builder The Simpsons Tapped Out from 2012 to promote the popular series, or Minions Run in 2013, which featured the minions from the Spickable Me movie franchise. Product placement is a technique of embedded marketing, where products, services or advertisements are being featured in a video production for a large audience, with the intent of promotion. Product placement in video games has three different categories, namely in-game advertising, advert games and through-the-line advertising. For the first category of in-game advertising, we can differentiate between static and dynamic ads. Static ads are integrated directly into the game during programming, which has some advantages. For example, no internet connection is required, meaning that ads are shown to all players, not only those who are connected. Like Subway in Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception in 2011 and Verizon in Alan Wake in 2010. In addition, ads could be a part of the storyline. For example, Nissin Cup Noodles in Final Fantasy 15 in 2016 
and Monster Energy in Death Stranding in 2019. This allows developers to provide a setting that involves more engagement with brands as we see players eat noodles and have energy drinks. There are some disadvantages, for example, advertisers cannot update ads if they went outdated, or track ads and check user data. Dynamic game advertising commonly places ads in billboards and posters within the game. These ads could be updated regularly, tracked in details, and tailored for specific users demographically. For example, dynamic in-game billboard advertisements were purchased in 10 states by presidential candidate Barack Obama in many Xbox games. A third type of product placement in-game advertising is in a mixture between dynamic and static ads, that is, interstitial ads, which are commonly used in mobile games. Basically, the term interstitial refers to a placement between layers. Interstitial ads have different kinds, among which are video interstitial ads, which are full-screen advertisements that show up at regular intervals in the game and cover the application interface. Advantages of interstitial ads include the certain exposure to advertisements which are easily designed in video formats. One disadvantage is the continuous pause of the gaming experience, which may irritate users. The second category of product placement is advert games, which are games designed specifically to promote a product or a service. Commercial advert games include Pepsi Man, a 1999 game based on a series of Japanese TV commercials of Pepsi and Sneak King, the official video game by Burger King in 2006. A third example is BMW M3 Challenge in 2007, which was developed in collaboration with the BMW engineers to allow gamers to test drive BMW M3 coupés and go in a head-to-head -head race. Another type of advert games is by movie marketers, as the official sites of movies provide links to low bandwidth flash animation games designed to be played on web browsers. However, most of these flash games are simple and do not represent the art and technology of Hollywood movies. There are also movie licensed video games that feature movie characters, starting in 1982 with Raiders of the Lost Ark, as already mentioned. Disney has a set of licensed games, such as Disney is Aladdin by Virgin Games and Disney Software in 1993. Political and military examples of advert games include America's Army, developed by the army itself in 2002 to inform and recruit soldiers. The third category of product placement in video games is through-the-line advertising, inducing players to visit certain URLs that sometimes have clues for the game, such as Enter the Matrix in 2003. But why are product placements in video games important? The video game landscape is massively influenced by other industries. Those industries use video games as a tool to reach a wide player audience, which might be influenced by football and soccer, but also politics, military and drugs. One example would be the car industry, from the first instance with The Need for Speed from 1994 until today's even more realistic Gran Turismo series, the typical racing game is a genre that is deeply connected to the automobile industry. Advert games, product placements, or even no advertising at all, the genre is supporting its related industry nonetheless through its mere presence. Car manufacturers get the possibility to reach an audience in a literally playful experience, compared to the seriousness and strictness of a car dealership. Digital marketing manager Brian McCleary from Ford says this, It's a great opportunity for us to talk to the public in an unintimidating environment where they can do things on their own terms. And statistics support the big impact of product placements. It strengthens Ford's brand ratings and brand recognition nearly as much as their non-gaming advertising alone. Ford itself mostly gets paid by gaming companies to allow the usage of their cars. In such deals, car manufacturers provide the data to portray their cars in a realistic way. Yet deals for video games with violent content, like the Grand Theft Auto series, does not happen very often, as it might influence the brand perception in a negative way. The question you could ask now is whether product placement in video games will one day be in the same scope as it is in movies today. The answer is probably no, because game developers rely on other companies, like Ford for example, to feed them with their products and data about them. Thus, to a certain extent, the game industry is being controlled by other industries. Another example would not really be an industry, but more an institution. First-person shooters have always been a big part of video games, but especially since the release of Doom in 1993, it has a fixed place in the industry. Like racing games, shooters also strive for realism, and realistic depictions of military themes have become the norm. One may think that this setting would primarily be used for selling guns, and that is definitely happening. Barrett, which manufactures the M82 50 caliber rifle, has admitted to consciously having them placed in games like Battlefield 4 to attract a young audience as possible future owners. 
what he would need for such a rifle for in day-to-day -day life, only Barrett knows. This realistic depiction has also enabled video games to be used for other purposes. The military uses games for strategizing, panning, training and PTSD treatment. But they have also used games for recruitment. In 2002, the American military released a game called America's Army, which was purposely designed to interest children in the military to recruit them later in life. The latest version is from 2013 and can be played for free on Steam. When asked about the game, Colonel Casey Wardinsky said, We want kids to come into the army and feel like they've already been there. It's designed to give them an inside view of the very fundamentals of being a soldier. It's also designed to give them a sense of self-efficacy, that they can do it. You don't have to think about what it would look like, you can see what it looks like. This marketing strategy was really effective. In the first five years, nine million people played the game, and in 2003, one-fifth of the US Military Academy's freshman class reported having played the game. The violence in this game is purposefully tamed so that more younger people, even 30 year olds, can play the game. This is highly disturbing, because the main age for enlistment in the military in America is 17, for which you need the parents' permission. Studies have shown that the cognitive function of the brain that makes holistic, that means grounded and reflected, decisions is not fully functional at the age that children might be playing this game. The military is effectively drawing children into military service. Video games have a huge impact on today's society. They can inform what decisions we make and how we handle real life situations. In the next episode, we will take a look at how the process of placing a product in a game actually works.